So this is going to be a, a quicker presentation, just like it was yesterday afternoon with the do's and don'ts. Um, what I'm going to do is we're going to go through this. I will start the other presentation about CLEX um, or Simple Seal. I use those terms interchangeably. Uh, so we will start that, we'll go to lunch, come back, finish that up, and then head outside and do the, uh, the hands-on demo. So just so everybody, we're deviating from the agenda slightly, I just wanted to make sure everybody is on board. I apologize for the graininess of the, the picture, but can anybody tell us what's wrong with uh, these two pails here? Bubbles. bubbles. Bubbles, correct. The bubbles on this one. And it's hard to see on this one from where you're sitting, but I can see it uh, plain as day here. It's not mixed. It's, there's striations in it. You can kind of tell in here it's separated a little bit. It's different from this color here. We want to make sure when we're installing the or getting ready to install the material, we mix it up so it's homogeneous. It's one uniform color. There's no striations. But we also don't want to introduce air into it. So this is a situation where uh, there was a large void and they had to, they had to structurally anchor something there. Uh, what we had to do is they had to use uh, an epoxy because we couldn't use our sealant in that situation because the sealant moved more um, than uh, the requirement that they had. What we had to do in that situation to make sure that we could bond to that epoxy was we had to cast sand into it. So the epoxy came in and then we came in with sand over top of it when it was still wet to make sure that the base coat had something good to bite onto as opposed to the, uh, the epoxy itself. We talked about pinholes and voids and waterproofing a lot yesterday. The same goes for here. And if you have a large void where you can see about a half of that key is stuck in the, uh, the hole, that should be filled. That should be patched or repaired. Um, I'll give you an example. I did my own garage at home. And uh, I had voids like this all over my garage. What I actually did was I got some of the, uh, the Vulcan 45 SSL and I came in and I squeegeed that to level the surface. So that would be a situation where you would fill it with that Monarch 145 SSL uh, something to bring it back up to flush. If you had a lot of these and you had a bigger area, then I would suggest looking into a patching and repair uh, mortar type mixture that you could uh, purchase from uh, your Toximet rep. If you don't do that, if you don't take care of uh, making sure that your pinholes and voids are filled. You have these unsightly bubbles because you have so much material in there, it takes a long time for it to cure because it's not at that 25, thick, 25 mil thick uh, application. And then they start to create bubbles. As it gets warmer, these bubbles start to appear. So that's why we want to make sure that we do the surface prep up front that we don't have these issues after. Otherwise, you're coming in here and you're patching and repair on all of these unsightly areas in your coating. If you put the coating on, if you put the top coat on prior to putting on the, let me start over. If you put the top coat on to the base coat before the base coat is cured, the base coat is still going to cure and give off CO2 as a part of its cure react, cure mechanism. And you're going to create all these little bubbles. That's why you want to make sure that your base coat is properly cured before you're coming on top of it with the top coat. Just another example of do's and don'ts. Here's a situation where you can see this big mound. There was a big area of the base coat. It was a big chunk. And then again, same situation. It took forever to cure it. Outgas caused bubbles. It was very unsightly. You want to make sure that your application is smooth. If you're going down, you're using one of these, make sure you have no, um, what's the word, no uh, chunks of material left on the deck that end up creating these large bubbles or large protrusions. What we see sometimes is when people are in a hurry and the base coat may be totally cured, but the top coat or the intermediate coat are not cured, people start driving on the deck prematurely. They're turning to go around a corner or whatever. Their tire wheel will tear up the, uh, the top coat of the coating if it's not cured fully. Here you can see an example of the tire on a membrane or a uh, coating that's not cured. They turned it and it tears it up. That's why we need to make sure it's down thick enough 
the top coat and it's totally cured. Similar example here where we had somebody who was driving on it prematurely and it's a little thin and you see all these layers because of the, uh, the torsion of the tire. What we see a lot of times happen is we'll have sand. This is why we only buy sand from one place in the United States because we've had bad experiences with other sand. Sometimes there will be iron ore oxide in the, uh, in the sand as a byproduct of their manufacturing process and that can rust through the coating and create this unsightly appearance. As I said, this is why we typically buy from one predominant sand supplier in the United States because we've had bad luck with other sand suppliers having that metal in there causing that rust, making it unsightly. Does anybody know what is going on here? That is the base coat. It's exposed. We talked early in the presentation about aromatic and aliphatic, which um, urethane coating layers were UV stable. This is an example of what happens with your aromatic base coat that does not get covered up with the aliphatic top coat. It will turn this ugly, unsightly green and it'll start to work its way up under that top coat on the top ledge. This is a, a set of stairs, treads and risers. It'll work its way up there and it could compromise the integrity of the coating over time. One of the, uh, one of the things that, if we're doing patches, right? So we're coming in and we're doing a small area. One of the things that we always recommend is to cut a reglet in the, uh, in the concrete. So it gives it a nice edge and then you would mask it to where the, uh, the deck would, your, your coating patch would stop. That's one of the do's if you're going to have that situation. We have another situation here where we had base coat that was too thick. It was outgassing. The, uh, the top coat was put on too early. It trapped all that in there, created these unsightly bubbles. You can see more pictures of the same application. Here you can see a bunch of bubbles on the substrate. The substrate wasn't sufficiently dry. They didn't have their Trimex CME4 moisture meter. They just went on it when they thought it was ready. And you could see it wasn't. All that air got trapped into the base coat. I'm sorry, moisture got trapped into the base coat and created all these ugly, unsightly bubbles. Can uh, anybody guess what's wrong with this? Exactly, I heard somebody say it. This is a, a deck, and you can see all of their spiked rollers and stuff, or their spiked shoes off to the side. They have their 350 base coat down, they're contaminating it now with their shoes because they're putting all that dirt and debris on there. You, want, you don't want to introduce any contaminants. You want to make sure to keep your, your spiked shoes on, or if you have um, clean booties, something of that nature. You don't want to walk on the coating barefoot until it's all done. Bare boot, I should say. So here's a couple just high level suggestions. You can have issues if you don't have the proper surface prep. The surface prep that we suggest is listed in the application instructions for the product. We, if you don't have any adhesion uh, testing to verify things, uh, you probably want to go with the primer uh, because we want to make sure that what we're suggesting is going to be acceptable, that your concrete is acceptable. If you're not going to bother with an adhesion test, then just go straight with the primer. Damp or green concrete is important to be taken into consideration here. We want the concrete to be sufficiently cured. We want to make sure that moisture content, as I said, is below that, is in between that 4.5 and 6% with a primer or below 4.5% with uh, um, no primer. We want to make sure that the substrate is clean. We talked about this in the waterproofing presentation yesterday. A lot of times the concrete will have curing agents or release agents, form release agents. We want to make sure that those are removed. The whole point of a form release agent is so you can remove the form from the concrete so it doesn't stick to it. What do you think is going to happen if we install a coating on a form release agent? It's not going to stick to it. So we want to make sure that those are removed from the system. One of the issues where we see people, one of the times where we see people have issues is if they don't mix the product properly. It might not cure right. If you have a two-part you're trying to mix up and you don't properly mix it, you could have some areas that cure and some areas that don't. 
That's why we want to make sure everything is well mixed. We want to make sure the application of this is done correctly. We have application instructions for a reason. I would suggest you reference them when you're on a job site. Uh, what I see guys do all the time is they're working on a job site and they have a binder. And in that binder they have the product data sheet, they have the application instructions, they have the MSDS for all of the products being used. That way they don't have to call somebody in the office, they can look at the answer right in front of them in their binder. Um, what else do we have to talk about? We have to talk about the uh, improper applications, making sure that's done correctly by having that reference available to you on the job site, um, and inclement weather conditions. If it's going to thunderstorm two hours after you put the base coat down, it's probably not the best time to put down your base coat. You want to look at the weather forecast when you're installing these products. Here's another don't. You don't want to have this guy working on your job site. Here's another situation where you could <laughs> make some people very unhappy with you. <laughs> if you have uh, expansion joints, you need to make sure that those are sealed prior to coating because that's going to make a very unhappy car owner. I could tell you if somebody put that on my truck, I would be a little upset. With that being said, that is all that I have for the coatings section of the uh, class.